Hi everybody and welcome back, or should I stop and welcome myself back? Although it has just been a week since I last posted, it feels much longer. I'm finally home, but as you know, it takes a few continents and many hours to get from Canada to South Africa. In an effort to learn from my previous mistakes, I decided to give myself some time to recover and re -climatize. I left Canada with temperatures of minus 11 and minus 16 and arrived in South Africa to temperatures of 38 and 42 degrees. So it's no joke <laughs> to adjust from cold moist air to very dry warm air. I literally slept for two days only to wake up and get up to shower and eat. <laughs> anyway, during my absence, so many things happened that I actually do not know where to start. The judge in Andrew's case decided to let it proceed and Andrew was stripped of his military titles, patronages and is restricted from using his HRH styling. And although I really do not wish to talk about Andrew today, there is now one thing glaringly obvious and which we need to touch on before moving on. And that is that we now have two royals in the line of succession who are now clearly non-working royals, having been stripped of their military titles and patronages and both restricted from using the His Royal Highness styling. Yes, indeed, as of today, the 18th of January 2022, both Harry and Andrew are both still in the line of succession. Harry, obviously at number six, and Andrew at number nine. So my question is, why are they, Harry and Andrew, still in the line of succession? Harry stepped back, stepped down and stepped deeper into the shit and even moved out of Great Britain and now lives in Montecito in the United States. Andrew retired or was forced to retire and as far as I'm concerned, that means he was no longer prepared to work at being a royal. And of course, now we are all aware of his other legal woes. How or why on earth would Her Majesty allow for them to remain in the line of succession? Everyone may shrug and say, so what? Harry is number six and Andrew number nine. Well, my dears, with the current line of succession, that doesn't mean much. The average life expectancy of the British male is 79 years and Prince Charles, number one in the line of succession, is already 73 years old. William and his children at numbers 2, 3, 4 and 5 are still young and can still look forward to a long life ahead, but they are all from the same family. And although the Queen has requested that William stop flying, he still travels with his whole family when going on private trips and holidays. And of course, they still attend events together. God forbid that something like this happens, but it could take one accident or one act of terror to remove the entire family from the line of succession. Also of some concern is the fact that numbers 3, 4 and 5 are all under the age of 21 and therefore if for some reason Charles and William become incapacitated it is very likely that Harry will be the first person to be asked to become regent. And guess what guys? If he declines, the next in line to become regent according to the line of succession would be Prince Andrew. And for as long as Harry and Andrew officially remain in the line of succession, that will be the case. <laughs> and in my opinion, a huge slap in the face for the British public and members of the Commonwealth. As of today's date, Harry, Meghan and Andrew still have pages on the Royal website. In Andrew's case, however, 
The first item, at least, refers to the statement issued by Buckingham Palace announcing that Andrew is stripped of his military titles and royal patronages. However, Harry and Meghan's page just mentions that they announced in January 2020 that they are stepping back as senior members of the royal family. So my next question is obviously what we have all been wondering. Why are these non-working royals still on the royal website? I sincerely feel that by leaving them on the website, true, loyal and hard-working royals like the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and the Earl and Countess of Wessex and Princess Anne are being humiliated. And talking about the Earl of Wessex, when is Charles going to allow Edward to get his Duke of Edinburgh title? Yes, I know some people are saying, and it's actually true, that once Charles becomes king, all his dukedoms revert back to the crown, at which point he will then redistribute them. But this is a title promised to Edward, and it was Prince Philip's wish that Edward inherit the title. Like I told you in a previous video, there is apparently some ill feeling between Edward and Charles and so much so that Edward has not been seen at Windsor in months regardless of the fact that he stables his horses there. Edward, Sophie and their children also did not attend to Christmas lunch or dinner at Windsor either. The only people to go see the Queen at Windsor were Charles and Camilla and allegedly later or at some point Andrew and Sarah popped in. Now it's being told to me that the bit of animosity between Charles and Edward goes back a long time and that it has been fueled by gossip that Charles does not intend to ever give Edward the title of the Duke of Edinburgh but instead to keep it in abeyance until George is old enough to inherit the title. However, can Charles afford to snub his brother Prince Edward? In my opinion, he can't. The Earl of Wessex is currently 14th in the line of succession, with seven of those ahead of him being underage, and not just underage, but under the age of 10 for others being non-working royals. Thus, the only working royals ahead of Edward being Charles and William. I find it grossly unfair that Edward is still waiting to receive his Duke of Edinburgh title and that he is still so far down the line of succession. In my opinion, Harry and his children, one of which is a United States citizen by birth, should be removed forthwith and in my opinion Andrew should be removed forthwith and his children Eugenie and Beatrice should be given a choice as to whether they are prepared to step in for their father and Harry and take on some of their duties. If not they and their children should also be removed from the line of succession I think that would only be fair and of course that will place Edward in a well-deserved number six spot. Another reason why this kind of revamp of the line of succession is very important and which many people have forgotten about or I thought everyone forgot about it until I was about to tape this narration and I found this particular article referring to the current councillors of state. Now, councillors of state are those members of the royal family who are authorised to carry out most of the official duties of the sovereign when he or she is incapacitated or out of the country. These councillors of state are usually the sovereign's spouse and the first four members of the family in the line of succession who are older than 21. Under current law, Prince Charles, William, Harry and Andrew are councillors of state.
but Harry lives in the United States and Andrew is retired from official duties. Neither Harry or Andrew are thus able to step up at short notice. The next in line to act as Council of State is Princess Beatrice, but with a young family and a career of her own, it is highly unlikely that she would be willing or able to do so. After Beatrice would be Eugenie, and the same applies to her. After Eugenie is Prince Edward. So my question is, why on earth are they currently considering to appoint Camilla to the councillors of state? Something which will happen automatically when Charles becomes king. But why appoint her now or why even consider appointing her now when Prince Edward and the Princess Royal, Princess Anne, are they willing and able to do their duty? Why would they consider or be drawing up documentation to appoint Camilla ahead of time? It doesn't make sense. Both Edward and Princess Anne had been trusted and loyal and hard-working royals for many, many years. In my opinion, this reeks of Charles's jealousy and deviousness to me. And I would like to know what you think. Is it because he knows that Anne and Edward have very few skeletons, are capable of hard work and could, with little effort, become more popular than he is? Is that why Charles appears to try his damnest to keep the limelight off his only sister and younger brother? And unfortunately, and regardless of the many, many stories, some even true, of the rift between Harry and his father, it is also 100% true that Charles still envisions a slimmed down monarchy with himself, William, Harry, and their wives as the core family. Many people are arguing this, but I promise you that is exactly what came out of Charles's mouth towards the end of 2021. And I believe that is also why he extended an olive branch to Harry by mentioning him in an essay for Newsweek and praising him for passionately fighting climate change, which we all know is actually nonsense and that Harry does not really give a fig about climate change and that Harry shall continue to travel by private jet for as long as he can afford it. It is also said that Charles invited Harry and his family to stay with him in February 2022 for the kickoff to the Queen's Jubilee year. But regardless of the media and public being very aware of Harry's hypocrisy and despite and regardless of Harry's animosity towards Britain, the monarchy the, and the royal family, and despite the fact that many Brits do not care for Harry being back on British soil, it is still Charles's hope to reincorporate Harry into the family and monarchy. Why that is the case, I do not know and neither does anyone else. There has to be a good reason for it. But at this point, only Prince Charles knows what that reason is. In my opinion, and I do admit that I may be wrong and there may be more nefarious reasons, but in my humble opinion, Charles may be keen on Harry as statistically, Harry is currently far less popular than his father and is likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. And what better way to boost your own popularity than to be compared to someone who is disliked and even despised in certain circles. Now, before I move on, I just want to point out something which has little to do with Harry and Andrew and their shenanigans. And while we are being distracted by all of Harry and Andrew's shenanigans, we do not 
take the time to look at other things such as the power that Camilla has even before her husband becomes king. In 2016, the Queen appointed William to the Privy Council and simultaneously appointed Camilla to the Privy Council. This was an unprecedented move by the Queen and although a few newspapers questioned it, it did not exactly make the front page headlines. However, if Camilla is to be appointed to the councillors of state now, before Charles becomes king, she will have more influence and power than two blood royals, namely Princess Anne and Prince Edward. And perhaps you, my dear British subscribers, should ponder that for a moment. Okay, my dear friends, I am a bit behind on talking about all the royal issues, but I am aware of Harry's legal threat against the British government with regards to his family security when in the United Kingdom during the Jubilee celebrations, blah, blah, blah. But I'm glad to see that the government basically laughed at him. And I read that it's now said that the Harkles have now decided not to attend the Jubilee celebrations. And for that, I say hallelujah. Thank you very much. The last thing I want to see this year is Harry and Meghan on the balcony with the Queen. No, thank you. Anyway, guys, I'm still settling in at home and life is hectic, getting school books and work ready for the year, the car license to be renewed, my own driver's license needs to be renewed, my studio office and craft space needs to be set up again and so on. But regardless of all that, I'm home now and my first priority will be, as always, you, my dear subscribers. And I just know that this year will provide us with a lot to talk about. So I'll see you again soon, I promise. Until then, take good care of yourselves. Bye.